Autism refers to a collection of neurological variations. The term neurological, by the way, means relating to the way the brain functions. Now, said variance relates to a broad range of traits with some of the most common including the following. Source from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Number 1. Different sensory experiences. For example, heightened sensitivity to light, difficulty interpreting internal physical sensations, hearing loud sounds as soft and soft sounds as loud, or synesthesia. Number 2. Non-standard ways of learning and approaching problem solving. For example, learning difficult tasks such as calculus before simple tasks such as addition. Difficulty with executive functions or being simultaneously gifted at tasks requiring fluid intelligence and internally disabled at tasks requiring verbal skills. Number 3. Deeply focused thinking and passionate interest in specific subjects. Narrow but deep. These special interests could be anything from mathematics to ballet, from doorknobs to physics, and from politics to bits of shiny paper. Number 4. A typical, sometimes repetitive, movement. This includes stereotyped and self-stimulatory behaviour such as rocking or flapping, and also the difficulties with motor skills and motor planning associated with apraxia or dyspraxia. Number 5. Need for consistency, routine and order. For example, holidays may be experienced with more anxiety than pleasure, as they mean time off from school and the disruption of the usual order of things. People on the autistic spectrum may take great pleasure in organising and arranging items. Number 6. Difficulties in understanding and expressing language as used in typical communication, both verbal and non-verbal. This may manifest similarly to semantic pragmatic language disorder. It's often because a young child does not seem to be developing language that a parent first seeks to have a child evaluated. As adults, people with an autism spectrum diagnosis often continue to struggle to use language to explain their emotions and internal state and to articulate concepts, which is not to say they do not experience and understand these. Point 7. Difficulties in understanding and expressing typical social interaction. For example, preferring parallel interaction, having delayed responses to social stimulus, or behaving in an inappropriate manner to the norms of a given social context. For example, not saying hi immediately after another person says hi. Perhaps the best way to picture autism is to think of the brain as an audio mixer with a series of sliders, each slider representing a trait like the ones just listed. Now, every person on the planet has some degree of neurodivergence, some variance from the baseline. That is, differences in brain function to what we'd clinically consider typical. Humans aren't standard issue. Autistic people aren't the only ones who have neurodivergence. They simply express notably greater variance than allistic people in some of these traits. Allistic, by the way, means non-autistic. Yet even among autistic people, there's a massive range of difference. Some display differences in communication more than, say, in learning. Others display differences in both. More still will display differences in neither, but will instead display differences in thinking and project passion. There's really no one-size-fits-all mold or even singular spectrum when it comes to autism, since it's such a multifaceted part of human existence. Likewise, the level of support an autistic person requires throughout their life will vary. Some require high levels of care, such as a full-time carer, whilst others are fully capable of living on their own, and this can change over time. Some also seem to require no support at all, but this could be less because they don't need support and more because they're denied support. Autism is, simply put, variance in brain functioning, and a significant portion of the issues many autistic people face today could be resolved if society were willing to make some relatively minor adjustments to accommodate a pretty significant portion of the human population. Things such as considering noise and light pollution, not requiring eye contact to maintain a conversation, 
being patient with miscommunications, respecting personal boundaries, accommodating differences in learning methods, understanding and respecting the importance of scheduling and ritual. Just a few things we could do to improve their lives. Taking society as a whole, autism has been identified in around one percent of the total population. However, thanks to improving awareness and knowledge surrounding autism, as many as one in every fifty-nine children in the U.S. are identified as being autistic. Autistic people are pretty common. By the way, I say autistic people because. That's what most self-advocates, like those at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network or ASAN, forward. However, it should be noted that not all autistic people agree on certain things. For example, ASAN states rather clearly that they view autism as a developmental disability. Now, this surprised me personally, since most of the autistic people I've spoken to on the matter in recent years question this conclusion on the aforementioned grounds that. Many of the problems autistic people face arise not inherently as a result of their autism, but instead how society treats autistic people. And in doing my research, I found an article by autistic writer and anthropologist John Betton, in which they start by pointing out the double standard in that quote: "The notion of disability in our society is underscored by a bizarre conception of independence. Autists depend on assistance from others in ways that." Differ from the cultural norm, and that is pathologized. However, the many ways in which non-autistic people depend on others is considered normal, or rather, it is brushed under the carpet. Humans have evolved to live in highly collaborative groups with strong interdependencies between individuals, and in many cases, between groups. In our pre-civilized past, all human groups were small. And interdependence and need for mutual assistance was obvious to all members of a group. The tools of civilization, including money, have undermined our appreciation of interdependence, and within the Western world, have culminated in a toxic cult of competitive individualism, which, amongst the non-autistic population, ironically leads to extreme levels of groupthink. End quote. The article, by the way, which is titled. The myth of independence, how the social model of disability exposes society's double standards, goes on to discuss issues like social parasitism by groups such as landlords, and is a genuinely fascinating read. It's one of many such articles by autistic writers, which can be found on Neuroclastic. Now, of course, all this raises questions as to what we mean by disability and what purpose the label serves. It's one thing to question whether autism should. Technically, be classified as a disability in and of itself in a perfect society. It's another thing to do so in the societies we currently have. For example, the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, or AWN, shared a letter titled "Autism is a Disability," in which a mother of an autistic child detailed her problems at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom in 2012. How, in spite of having secured a guest assistance card beforehand, Many staff did not offer the assistance they were supposed to. Declassifying autism as a disability could potentially make that worse. So it's part of the conversation. Now, why am I going over all this information? Well, mainly to highlight my earlier point on how there is no one way of thinking when it comes to being autistic. Autistic people are not simple-minded or homogenous. From an outsider perspective, they seem to have been going through a bit of a renaissance for the past decade and a half, all thanks to increased connectivity and digital aids. Before, it was difficult for an autistic person to share their experience in a published medium without heavy gatekeeping, limiting the range of experiences shared and what could be said. In that regard, the internet has been a bit of a game changer. It's not only made it easier for people with access to the internet to network with one another, but also to share their own thoughts and have conversations that have largely been restricted to autistic individuals and a few token autistic people. It's certainly been a blessing for many non-verbal autistic people. As a result, there's still no consensus on many of the topics relating to the community. The more I sat here to try and come up with a unified front. The more it felt wrong in presenting detailed positions like these to be definitive, 
Talk to any two autistic people on matters like these, and you'll get three different answers. Hell, I originally quoted Asan in the opening sentence of my video defining autism, and my editor, Levi, was like, nope, that's got problems, namely the way it suggested that autism is a singular neurological variation. Neurodivergent philosophy is a budding field, one we should all take the time to study and appreciate without forcing our views into the discussion. And to that end, I suggest looking into these three organisations and their work as a place to start. Both the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network partake in education and community support, whilst Neuroclastic host autistic voices from around the world. This video is not a substitute for the work and discussions had by autistic people, and I don't want to pretend like it is. So I'll be linking each of the aforementioned organisations in the description box below, just under the link to the transcript and content warning. Now speaking of content warnings, this video is about to turn towards a much darker subject matter. Everything from filicide to eugenics as we go on to talk about what happens when so-called advocates don't listen to the people they claim to be advocating on behalf of. For you see, as long as this renaissance has been happening, the rest of us, myself included, haven't been paying all that much attention. The result of which has been disastrous. Enter Autism Speaks, an organisation most autistic people seem to hold a deep-rooted hatred for. Founded in 2005, this US-based non-profit organisation was set up by Bob and Suzanne Wright after their grandson was found to be autistic. It had rapid success during its early years. Most notably, by the end of 2007, it had managed to have a United Nations resolution passed officially recognising the 2nd of April as World Autism Awareness Day, gaining international involvement with its Light It Up Blue campaign. So on the surface, this organisation, as well as both the Associated Day and Campaign, seem to be amazing things meant to help support members of the autistic community. Sadly, that is not the case at all, a fact readily explained by groups such as the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. This year, in fact, they published a leaflet which broke down a few of the key issues, starting with how only 1% of the money donated to Autism Speaks actually goes towards helping autistic people while it spends 20 times that on fundraising. Meanwhile, some of its employees have annual salaries that exceed 600,000 US dollars. Similarly, only a single member of its board of directors is autistic. Meanwhile, 23 out of the 28 seats are reserved for corporate sponsors. There is no room for self-advocacy at Autism Speaks which impacts the rest of what it does. 48% of its income is allocated to awareness campaigning and lobbying, which again, sounds very noble. That is until we acknowledge that said awareness campaigning involves political adverts like the following. I just want to play you the first half and see if you can notice the problem here. I am autism. I'm visible in your children, but if I can help it, I am invisible to you until it's too late. I know where you live, and guess what? I live there too. I hover around all of you. I know no color barrier, no religion, no morality, no currency. I speak your language fluently, and with every voice I take away, I acquire yet another language. I work very quickly. I work faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. And if you are happily married, I will make sure that your marriage fails. Your money will fall into my hands, and I will bankrupt you for my own self-gain. I don't sleep, so I make sure you don't either. I will make it virtually impossible for your family to easily attend the temple, a birthday party, a public park, without a struggle, without embarrassment, without pain. You have no cure for me. Your scientists don't have the resources, and I relish their desperation. 
Your neighbors are happier to pretend that I don't exist. Of course, until it's their child. I am autism. I have no interest in right or wrong. I derive great pleasure out of your loneliness. I will fight to take away your hope. I will plot to rob you of your children and your dreams. I will make sure that every day you wake up, you will cry, wondering who will take care of my child after I die. And the truth is, I am still winning, and you are scared, and you should be. I am autism. You ignored me. That was a mistake. This sort of shit is bad enough when it's done by the Discovery Channel during Shark Week. So to actually go ahead and use the same methods, only this time relating to people, is fucking appalling. The deep set voice, threatening to come for you and your family, comparing autism to diabetes and HIV, talking about how currently there is no cure, put a pin in that as it will be important later, all this does is further enforce stigma surrounding autism. Sure, it can be said to raise awareness, but it does so in the most destructive way imaginable. That's why the autistic community seems to become wary of autism awareness, because the very term awareness has become wrapped up in this notion that autism is mysterious and frightening, that it's actively hunting your children down as opposed to being an inherent part of their person. That's why in response to Autism Speaks, Autism Awareness Day, the community largely rejected it and went ahead to found the Autism Acceptance Month because that is the true goal here. That's what will actually improve the lives of not just autistic people, but those around them. Now this campaign ad was first aired on the 22nd of September of 2009 and received immediate backlash from the Autism Self Advocacy Network and more than 60 other disability rights organizations. And it's largely a style of campaigning Autism Speaks continues to use to this day. For many of you, this is most likely the first time you're hearing about the issue, and the same is true for many other people. Indeed, the problems inherent with Autism Speaks have largely gone unaddressed. In 2015, autistic writer Ebb wrote that, quote, Only now that a non-autistic man's book about neurodiversity, neurotrized by Steve Silverman, and editorial criticizing Autism Speaks have gained attention, do they seem to even acknowledge that there is a rift between them and autistic adults? End quote. And even then, it's still taken a long time to gain traction. I remember hearing about these things back at university whenever April would approach, and I have thankfully seen awareness growing with each passing year. But that's not to say that nobody has been speaking out on the issue. Indeed, even though the organization was first founded in 2005, the red flags were already up by the following year. Of significant importance was a public service announcement titled Autism Every Day, which had a parent discuss how having an autistic child made them seriously consider murdering them. Now I'm going to play the relevant clip in a minute so you can understand just how countless autistic people in America heard their existence being discussed. But first, I'd like to remind you again, please, consider clicking away if the subject matter is likely to cause you emotional distress or harm. So with that made clear, here we go. There are parents what who are, are forced doing? to put kids in schools that are completely overcrowded and 12 kids and one teacher, and the, the kids okay. don't make progress. But I remember a, that was a very scary moment for me when I realized I had sat in the car for about 15 minutes and actually contemplated putting Jody in the car and driving off the George Washington Bridge and that that would be preferable to having to put her in one of these schools. And it's only because of Lauren, the fact that I have another child, that I probably didn't do it. There's just so much to say about this and none of it is pleasant. Like. Part of me can see that the mother, Alison Singer, is obviously struggling on some level, but even in light of that, I still find myself lacking any real empathy towards her and what she's saying, because the punch is really one-two here. 
On one hand, she talks about how the thought of her child, Jody, learning in a classroom with a 1 to 12 teacher to student ratio pushed her to consider murdering Jody whilst taking her own life. Then, in the very next breath, she admits that the only reason she hasn't done this is because it would impact the life of her other child. Which, can we just recognize the absurdity of? Yes, education is important. But to go from not being able to find a school with a teacher to student ratio lower than 1 to 12 to murder is just fucking vile. Parents of children with painful and debilitating medical conditions will fight tooth and claw to put their child through chemotherapy and similar treatments. Yet Alison believes the death of Jodie is preferable to her learning in an overcrowded environment. It's as if Alison doesn't think that Jodie's life has the potential for value, that she doesn't see Jodie as a real person. And this is further supported in the way that she elevates the value of one holistic child's well-being above the life of another autistic child. If an holistic child is worth fighting for, why is it any different for her autistic child? Both children's lives have value. Value that isn't altered by one of them being autistic. If you're willing to fight for one but not the other, then that is active dehumanization. And the way all of this is said with an earshot of Jody who is walking away to gaze out of a nearby window, it just fills my conscience with dread and sorrow. Their complete lack of care for the facts that Jody could be picking up on this and impacted by what they're saying. A complete absence of empathy and compassion in the room. This way of talking around Jody seems to be normalized by the environments Alison has been in and the people she's seen. However, as much as there is an issue of what Alison says here and elsewhere in the PSA, the bigger problem here is what Autism Speaks is doing. Namely in recording, editing, and having this broadcast. Without challenge, I must add. Can you imagine what it must have been like when this first aired in 2006? To be an autistic person, excited for the upcoming PSA. To tune in, to have your experiences shared with the world and hopefully make it more understanding and accepting, even if only slightly. Could you imagine having that hope torn away as the mother of an autistic child describes the way she put actual thought into the murder of said child? only stopping herself on account of her holistic child. The message is clear. Autistic children are not only less than holistic children, but they're a burden only worth overcoming for the benefit of an holistic child. Think of the insecurities that could create or perhaps even deepen for autistic viewers. Because here's the sad fact. This is not an isolated instance. This sort of fatalistic thinking occurs in other families with an autistic member. And that does not make it right. It screams to the systemic problem that the autistic community faces. Yet rather than challenge that, Autism Speaks capitalizes on it. They capture this moment in Allison. They frame her as a brave soldier up against the nihilistic monster of autism. And this sort of rhetoric is infectious. A fact very clearly shown later on in what Jodie's sibling says. I wish I had a sister without autism. Rather than the sibling learning to understand, accept and appreciate Jodie for who she is, they simply wish she was another person entirely. And the child isn't to blame for this. It's Allison and groups such as Autism Speaks who have taught them this. And that's part of the real danger here. In broadcasting what Allison has said unchallenged, Autism Speaks is normalizing the murder of autistic children. It's treating the thought of killing one's child as so normal to the point of being almost expected. There's really no pause in Allison's train of thought. And this is part of a PSA intended to educate others on how having autistic children 
impacts the lives of parents, which is actually the whole game when it comes to Autism Speaks. It's a lot less Autism Speaks, more parents of autistic children speak. Indeed, the whole PSA and almost all of their other public awareness campaigns are centered on the holistic perspective, harping on about their woes in the face of their child's diagnosis. To quote my editor, Levi, on the matter, quote, I guess it's important to talk about the total neglect of autistic children by Autism Speaks. When a child has a problem, usually, they're put first, no matter how the parents are struggling. But Autism Speaks doesn't spare a single thought for autistic children. It's all about autistic parents and siblings. An organization that claims to advocate for autistic people actively refuses to consider them for even a moment. They actively encourage parents to absorb themselves in their own hopelessness and grief. I imagine an autistic child whose family is under the guidance of Autism Speaks would feel very alone. End quote. And that's not even considering the way Autism Speaks mistreats autistic adults. Autism Speaks' tendency to ignore and speak over the autistic perspective has resulted in an ongoing semantic battle between identity first and person first language, something that can cause real harm. On one hand, autistic self advocates tend to prefer the identity first labels of autistic child or autist, one reason being it acknowledges autism as an inherent and important part of their person. It's something that makes them the very person they are and cannot be separated from their lived experience. Identity First proudly announces that fact and lets others in the vicinity know that autism is not a dirty word. It can be a liberating experience to say, I'm autistic, standing in defiance of a lifetime of societally taught shame. On the other hand, in part due to the way groups such as Autism Speaks present autism like a life-draining disease, many parents aren't comfortable referring to their child as being an autistic child, preferring instead the person-first approach in calling them a child with autism, much in the same vein as a child with cancer. Autism Speaks sides with the person-first approach, the effect of which is that it frames autism as something external something that can be targeted and eradicated without harming the individual, something that explains the harm and neglect the group's campaigns result in. It also seeks to remove basic autonomy from autistic people in removing their choice. Whilst Identity First is generally seen as more accepted by self-advocates and therefore the default, there are autistic people who prefer person first, and that's something that's respected on a personal level. However, very often when an autistic person or self-advocacy group like Asan use the approach preferred by autistic people, parents of autistic children will use that as a way to derail conversation, replacing the way autistic people feel with the way they feel as an holistic parent. It was such an incident at one of their meetings that led Asan to clarify their usage of identity first language, which is a third way this can impact the lives of autistic people. It can become a massive time sink. Every hour that has to be spent explaining to allistic people the very facts that identity first is the approach preferred by autistic people and why, is an hour not spent on self care or on addressing other issues. Sadly, this is a common issue with the status quo in general. The idea that people, not belonging to marginalized communities, have any right to dictate the language said community uses to refer to itself and describe its experiences. However, one thing most other groups lack are institutions walking around claiming to advocate for them and propagating such rubbish, giving a sense of legitimacy to the issue which it frankly doesn't have. So these problems that are still in existence with Autism Speaks to this day are not new and neither is the criticism they have received from the autistic community on the subject. For example, one remark parroted throughout the PSA was the idea that the children were unresponsive, something that was called out in 2006 by 
Amanda Baggs in her essay, exactly who is unresponsive here. Amanda notes the way in which the footage shown in the Autism Speaks PSA shows this to simply not be true, that the children are shown to communicate and respond with those around them. The real problem is the way in which the parents don't pay attention. I remember picking up on this at the start. Alison talked about her going to the park, how it was difficult for her because the other parents didn't understand Jodie's autism, specifically how they stared at her and her daughter because her daughter was screaming and fighting to get off the swings. And like Amanda, I found myself asking, how was that not a response? You've put Jodie in a situation that they're very clearly uncomfortable with, and they're communicating their emotional distress in one of the most overt ways imaginable. And yet, because they're not verbal about their distress, that apparently makes them unresponsive, which is frankly absurd. A fact driven home by just how easy society accommodates different communicative needs among allistic people. Non-native speakers of a language struggle to understand idioms the same way native autistic speakers do. But people tend to have patience only for non-native speakers over their autistic family and acquaintances. One thing I've actually seen in dating Adita is that a lot of British idioms, well, they go right over her head. And there are stories and jokes she attempts to translate from Hindi or Bengali that don't exactly work for the same reason. Now the way we handle that is by taking the time to explain things and listening to each other. And whilst there are those that fail to appreciate this variation in human communication, many of us see said divergence as a blessing, not a curse. Or as an example of something close to home for many people, what about emoticons? Many of us use them to convey information, including our emotional state, which is often lost in text-based chat. And our understanding of emoticons didn't just spring up overnight. In the beginning, those who weren't in the know would read a face sticking its tongue out as a colon P, not an actual face. It's only as they had the basics explained to them, as they learned this new method of communication, that they began to grasp it. So, we're clearly more than capable of understanding different forms of communication. But when it comes to bettering the lives of autistic people, it's viewed as autistic people having unreasonable expectations. Rather than, say, helping parents to understand how to read their children's body language and communicate effectively, all Autism Speaks seems to do is tell parents that it's hopeless, that their child is unresponsive. And from this taught hopelessness comes one of the most vile elements of Autism Speaks and their work. Something else Alison touched upon in the PSA. I know that science is making great breakthroughs. And my hope is that by the time Lauren's ready to have a baby, we'll have a cure or we'll, we'll understand how to prevent autism. And this is where we come to eugenics research and lobbying, because here's an interesting fact. Alison Singer was actually vice president for Autism Speaks until 2009. That's right. The woman who openly admitted to thinking about killing her autistic child was vice president for an organization that claims to advocate for autistic people. Now, why did she leave? Well, it turns out that Autism Speaks was too radical even for her, namely in how they pumped a large portion of their research fund into trying to prove a connection between vaccines and autism. Yup, Autism Speaks officially held the position that vaccines cause autism right up until 2015. By the way, Alison Singer set up a new organization, the Autism Science Foundation, claiming at its launch that she had learned from her conversations with autistic people. Yet she still stood by what she said as reflecting how she felt at the time and held out that genetic research is necessary to help autistic people. In general, her apology, as I've seen it called, seemed to be rather dismissive of the concerns had by self-advocates. 
Sadly, I couldn't find any resources about the Autism Science Foundation on Asan, the AWN, or Neuroclastic. However, the good folk over at In The Loop about neurodiversity did class the organization as a damaging one that seeks a cure for autism, which is like we need to address in relation to both organizations. The notion of autism as something needing a cure is a highly controversial one with many autistic self-advocates being completely opposed to the idea, while parents of autistic children are in support of it. Often lines are drawn on the basis of functioning, this idea that there are two distinct types of autism, the gifted, high-functioning autistic person and the cursed, low-functioning autistic person. Yet, as noted at the start, autism doesn't exist along any one spectrum, so this distinction is inherently flawed. And yet, parents attempt to exclude autistic self-advocates from the conversation, declaring them high-functioning and therefore incapable of speaking on behalf of so-called low-functioning folk, seemingly oblivious to the hypocrisy inherent in the argument. Yet, rather than simply tell you how I feel, I thought it better to show you how non-verbal autistic people, such as Amanda Baggs, feel about the concept in their own words. Do note, the following clip comes from part of a response to a 2006 meeting between Autism Speaks and Grasp, that is, the Global and Regional Asperger Syndrome Partnership. Because whilst Allison is no longer with Autism Speaks, the position of Autism Speaks and the newer Autism Science Foundation are still the same on this matter. Therefore, this response is as relevant now as it was then. It is wrong to condescendingly assume that autistic self-advocates have never heard of those of us labeled low-functioning, and that somehow the so-called low-functioning among us have no skills and need a cure and that all you needed to do was say we exist and everyone would understand what you want to do to us. Our viewpoint was not represented in this exchange of ideas between rest and autism speaks. All the two of you have done is repeat caricatures. The autistic child happy in a world of her own versus the autistic child needing to be cured. High functioning versus low functioning. Asperger versus autism. Able versus incapable. You have equated differences in the way we function with differences in the amount of rights we deserve. These things are not how we live, and you have avoided the substantial issues, including the fact that it is not only those labeled high-functioning who oppose cure. Your articles promote misunderstanding, not understanding. Both of you have essentially told the world that I and others like me do not exist. I am here to tell you and the rest of the world that we do. In the same vein, Assange states that, quote, Autism is a developmental disability. It affects many things about the way we learn, move, communicate, and experience the world. Disability is a natural part of human diversity. However, our society is set up in a way that excludes people with disabilities, including autistic people. Our society says that disability is a problem and that the solution is to cure the disability or to try and make the person less disabled. The disability rights movement says that people with disabilities are not the problem. Instead, society is a problem when it does not accommodate people with disabilities. Assam believes that instead of trying to change disabled people, we should work to make sure people with disabilities can access what we need. End quote. Amy Sequenzia, a writer for the AWN, has also gone on to say, quote, When neurotypicals say we are hateful, it is usually following our response to mentions of the need to cure autism. The words used are hopeless, tragic, without future, descending, and devastating. Using such descriptions to attack autism is to attack us. Curing autism means getting rid of us. End quote. As for neuroclastic, 
There are so many articles on their site sharing autistic views on the very notion of a cure that it would be impossible to go over every single one. However, if you have four minutes to spare, then I would suggest reading Ren Everett's A Letter to Procure Autistic People. Because yes, there are autistic people out there who argue in favour of a cure, though they are few and far between. This is not unexpected by any stretch. There are many LGBT plus people with internalised queer phobia who argue in favour of a cure. That does not necessitate that such a thing would be ethical. It should be kept in mind that these are people who, among other things, have been told that their autism is what needs to change. That has been the main narrative in the lives of many autistic people, though there are other reasons as well, ones the autistic community needs to discuss themselves, which is why I'm suggesting this article. It's grounded and compassionate towards autistic people of a different view, whilst being unflinching in theirs, which is important since, all hypotheticals aside, the current conversations surrounding cures for autism have resulted in some really harmful shit. For example, it makes it very easy for religious groups such as the Last Reformation to come in and prey on desperate parents and autistic people. The Last Reformation, led by Danish man Torben Sondergaard, teaches that autism is the result of demons. Demons the movement claims they can exercise by performing baptisms on autistic people inside wheelie bins. But it's not just religious quackery that's the problem. MMS, known as Miracle Mineral Supplement, is touted as a miracle cure for those with various conditions, including autism. MMS is more commonly known to the scientific community as chlorine dioxide, being an industrial bleach that can cause poisoning, renal failure, and the mucous membrane to shed from the stomach, esophagus, and intestines if consumed. The dangers of a so-called cure are certainly not hypothetical for autistic people. They're very much real and causing active harm, and sadly, the people behind these horrific practices seemingly tend to get away with it. Do you remember Torben Sondergaard, the leader of the Last Reformation? His practice was called into question by the Danish government, which began an investigation in 2019, and all Sondergaard had to do to escape that was move to North Carolina in the US, where he continues his harmful practices. By the way, this is not an exhaustive list of everything Autism Speaks has ever done. There's a lot of discussion about how they use their lobbying money and how it fails to uphold the basic human rights of autistic people who still face discrimination on matters such as marriage and child rearing. This is just a sample of the problems said organisation has. So how do things move on from here? Well, clearly, don't donate to Autism Speaks. Instead, donate whatever you can to organisations like the Autism Self-Advocacy Network the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, and Neuroclastic. That's the first thing. And rather than lighting up things blue for autism awareness, try red instead to raise autism acceptance. Also, read what autistic people have to say, not just on autism. Theirs is a perspective that has largely been ignored in society, even though, as members of society, they are impacted by society, policies on health and childcare, elections, LGBT+, and ethnic rights, these and many other things don't stop being important if someone is autistic. I know Neuroclastic has been publishing a number of articles in relation to COVID-19. Some, more general, here's what you do to decrease your chances of catching it guides, whilst others are discussions about the precautions autistic people are being forced to take. For those who don't know, states such as Alabama are considering rationing care based on disability status, regardless of whether said disability has an impact on your likelihood to survive COVID-19. Effectively, COVID-19 is being forwarded as a eugenics tool to decrease the total number of disabled people, including autistic people, in various parts of the world. 
something autistic content producer Faye Fahrenheit has written on, discussing five measures autistic people can take to try and ensure that they receive the best care on offer. Being aware of these sorts of things and the impact everything can have will give each of us the tools to be better advocates for autism and autism acceptance. Because really, they need allies. Whilst one may think that just being heard is a main problem for self-advocates when they go up against groups like Autism Speaks, sadly that's just not true. Do you remember Amanda from earlier? Well, in 2013, she found herself victim to a particularly egregious smear campaign. It seems that the parent of an autistic child took issue with Amanda and others rejecting this narrative that they are broken people who need curing. So, she set about rooting through Amanda's past and forwarding elements of it to assert that Amanda was lying about her autism, that she couldn't possibly be non-verbal. She was so desperate to silence a self-advocate that offended her sensitivities that she went ahead and contacted multiple people from Amanda's past, interviewing each before being published in Slate magazine, all as part of an attempt to discredit a single autistic self-advocate that made her uncomfortable. This, even though Amanda Baggs had been very open about the facts that there were portions of her childhood where she could speak and was even considered gifted. As mentioned in her 2007 interview with fellow autistic writer Donna Williams, but framing it as an expose meant the parent could pretend like Amanda had a dirty secret when really she didn't. The parent was just grasping at straws. So this sort of thing is how people like Amanda are routinely targeted, over the simple fact that she refused to remain silent when parents go on TV and tell the world that they've honestly thought of killing their own child. There is a concerted effort by groups such as Autism Speaks and the parents they have misled to silence autistic self-advocates critical of their actions. I can't help but wonder if they feel they've gone too far to turn back. And autistic people are going to need all the support they can get in facing this problem. So please, remember to not celebrate Autism Awareness Day by lighting it up blue. In its place, celebrate Autism Acceptance Month by going red instead. Because acceptance, not awareness, is what autistic people actually want and need to be accommodated for as a part of society. Not acknowledged as separate to it. Now I'd just like to thank a Levi called Bird for helping me write this piece. Levi is an autistic YouTuber who puts out videos relating to LGT plus topics and abuse. This video would not have been possible without him, so do check out his work. And if you appreciate what myself and Adita do here on the channel in fighting back against misinformation, do know you can support us on Patreon. Your support gives us the funds to keep going and keep putting out videos involving this level of research. You can also check out our other videos to see more of what we have to offer. So with that said, we'd just like to thank all our patron sponsors, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Soraya and Katie, Garrett Van Voorst, Chelsea Williams, Doyle Jackson, Wellington Marcus, Sosh Daniels, Justin Allen, and Atlas Five. And for myself and Adita, take care now.